To be serious left an interesting comment on my previous video concerning um, the distinction that I drew, which is somewhat arbitrary and artificial, I admit, between orthodox, sort of, would you call it, dharmic um, philosophies. In other words, orthodox Jainism, orthodox Buddhism, even orthodox Hinduism, yes, there is such a thing. And Tantra. Um, in the West, there there seems to be a very clear line between the two, between, say, the occult and the orthodox, um, between the esoteric and the, uh, the the orthodox, to the point where the orthodox has essentially anathematized the um, the esoteric S Satanism, right? Um, <clears throat> now, she's right that that distinction, at least in the East, isn't as clear-cut as one might think, because if you look at the way that people in India or Cambodia or wherever um, actually uh, live their lives, it's never entirely clear what side they're erring on, because, you know, for just the, the base assumptions that they both share, in other words, reincarnation or something along those lines, like what I'm saying about eternal existence or just the brute fact of existence <coughs> sometimes takes on the the dimensions of, or it takes on the the terminology of a belief in reincarnation. Now, if you believe in reincarnation, it's almost like you can almost surf the sort of stream of becoming, or the surf the wheel of existence by saying, "Okay, in this life, I'm going to." really restrain myself, be incredibly moral, a very good person, and maybe even become a monk or something, to better my position in the next life. You're not really trying to get off the wheel of existence. Now, nobody's going to say this, but you get the impression by watching what they do that that's really more what they're interested in. Because, like most people, you're not really concerned about abstractions. You're only concerned about things that you can actually sink your teeth into, your own personal quality of life in the here and now, and your quality is based upon your view of the world. You see a world in which some people have a lot and some people have nil, especially in the East. When you have nil, you really have nil. <coughs> so you would think, okay, then the best thing to do is for me to be a good guy now, and my next few lives I'll be much better off than now. That's not really renunciation, is it? It's not really seeking samsara. Or sorry, seeking nirvana and forsaking samsara. It's just trying to ride the wheel of existence more efficiently, I guess. Um, and throughout the entirety of all these dharmic faiths, like <coughs> or philosophies, like Buddhism, Jainism, Hinduism, um, tantric imagery is very, very powerful element. A very powerful element. Um, but again, if you talk to people in these countries about Tantra, they'll say that's crazy. Like I mentioned Theravada Buddhism in another video, I think, and the, that's the common one in Southeast Asia, and they sort of pride themselves on saying that we're closer to the original teachings of the Buddha, and those people in, say, Tibet, or, you know, they're more interested in the esoteric. They're more interested in the weird stuff, you know. Um, but you observe the way they live, and it's pretty sure, pretty apparent that uh, the distinction even there between Theravada and Mahayana is not as clear-cut, at least in terms of its aims in, its, in the lives of its individual participants. <coughs> so yes, it's, Tantra is considered insane, I guess, in a lot of quarters, and I would probably say the majority opinion in, in the East is that Tantra is kind of crazy, and it's impossible to understand, and uh, I'm speaking to a predominantly Western audience, and I'm fully prepared to have everyone think that I'm a complete lunatic here. Um, it doesn't bother me. Um, but, you know, I, I understand that objection. When you start looking at charts of the subtle body, or when you start showing images of ferocious gods decapitating themselves or biting their worshippers' heads off or stuff like that, you're likely to sort of say, this is just too crazy. You're going to have the same uh, reaction as, say, a cloistered monk from medieval France coming across a hidden satanic 
temple in a cave somewhere. It's just going to be so weird and so utterly different from what he's used to that he's just going to, you know, instinctively, on his own volition, in his own view of things, he's going to anathematize it all and say it's all just blasphemous insanity. And <clears throat> that is what the reaction that I expect from most people in the West. And as I say, I tried to describe what, I, what my actual practices are in previous videos. And it's not that it's personal to me. It's just very, very difficult to explain what exactly you're attempting to do here. You're attempting to change your perceptions of just about everything. You're trying to change your perceptions of pleasure. You're trying to change your perceptions of pain. You're trying to change your perceptions of agony, ecstasy, um, everything. You're trying to transvalue, as Nietzsche would say, all values. You're trying to turn everything around. You're trying to turn around the horror to make it, or not to make it, wonderful, but to make your experience of it positive. You know, the poem from um, Vivekananda that I've quoted a few times, he who would dare misery love and hug the form of death, dance in destructions, dance to him the mother comes. Now this isn't completely alien to the Western tradition because you, you know, you go to a Catholic church and you're praying to this loving, merciful God and who is personified by the image of a human being nailed to a cross. You know, this this kind of weird sort of fiddling with value isn't totally alien. Uh, and I would say that the crucifix is a very tantric image. <clears throat> now, um, and Mendham mentioned his view of how all this works and what the rational reaction to it is. But even like it's hard to discuss this and he's you know, he, he said so. And it's really hard to not straw man the other guy when you're talking about what he has said. Um, <clears throat> now one of the interesting things about a life denying if you again that could be a straw man. One of the interesting things about say the difference between life-denying and life-affirming philosophies uh, is that I think, and again, I, I, I know that people are going to object to those terms, and I, I, please just bear with me here when, I, you know, when I'm just using these terms very loosely. Um, <clears throat> the base assumptions that each one is built upon are so different. Um it kind of brings me back to that image of the monk go going into a cave in medieval France and getting just shocked out of his tree by what he sees. Um, the, the basic assumptions are so different that it's not even a question of right or wrong. It's not even a question <coughs> of are the, is the, are the life deniers right or are the life affirmers right. Um, it's just what are your base assumptions. Um, I think that in Mendham relies upon a linear conception of time, a certain view of causality that is not circular but linear. Um, now in that he is completely erring on the side of the, or I shouldn't say err, but he's sort of chiming in on the side of the Western way of seeing things. Um, that today is different from every other day and tomorrow will be different in a fundamental sense and things are progressing or regressing or whatever. Or, um, But again, you run up against the metaphor of the hamster wheel as well and the futility of it all. And futility implies that there can't be any progress and that kind of thing. So it's, it's un, you know, I understand what that, that the hamster wheel is just a metaphor, but it's interesting how metaphors sort of tell a tale, eh? and metaphors are never perfect. But be that as it may, what I'm saying is I think that the perception of time, when we're talking, I asked him what is the future and what is the past, or I think it might have been just the future, what is my obligation to the future. And in a sense, <clears throat> I'm sort of saying that the future kind of doesn't exist in the sense that he posits its existence. 
because um, I'm looking at, say, determinism forward-looking as opposed to backward-looking. Everything that I do is determined, right? Let's just assume this for a second. Everything that I do is determined, okay? Everything I will do is determined as well. So, most people look at determinism backwards in terms of the past influencing the now or the future. Um, I'm looking at it in terms of, okay, whatever is going to happen is going to happen. And, you know, it's like Krishna um, talking to Arjuna on the battlefield of Kurukshetra. Uh, Arjuna is depressed. He doesn't want to go into the battle. He says, this is horrible. I want no part of this. And he just falls down and sinks into a deep depression. And Krishna says to him, you think you have the power to stop this battle from happening? This is necessity. Necessity is, I would say, is determinism, sort of, dare I say it, paid forward. Necessity is what must be. And <clears throat> and it tends to be necessity based upon the circumstances that you find yourself in right now. How much of what we do is contingent upon necessity as opposed to um, choice. And again, it's not, I'm not, I, I'm not even placing this in a scheme of determinism versus free will. I'm just sort of saying, what do you mean when you say determinism? Are you sh saying a determinism that is looking forward or a determinism that is looking backward for explanations of what I'm about to do or is what is about to happen? Because the past determines the future. So much of the future, how much of it, is an interesting question, already is determined. So you might look out and say, this is a horrific uh, thing that's about to happen, Arjuna, that you're being forced to fight your friends and relatives and teachers. But it's going to happen. And there's absolutely nothing you can do about it. And this is precisely, of course, why Arjuna is depressed. He says, this is insane. Existence is hellish. And... <clears throat> of course, we all know what, well, if you studied the Gita, we all know what the remedy or the prescription is for this. Um, now, that's an interesting way of looking at it. Uh, the determined past determining the future. I don't think that view of things is the only way of looking at determinism. Um how much of the future is already determined and how much of the present or our present perception our actual perception in the moment of perceiving real things as opposed to abstractions is actually determined it seems that almost everything is determined I'm sitting here and I'm looking at my webcam I'm looking at my computer screen I'm looking at the window behind it I'm looking at the thing here that's screwing up the color in my face and you know all of this is determined I now in the moment of becoming which we're all in right now and all of the things are determined by the past this is here because I hung it because my room is a mess my laundry room um, it's not something like I'm being presented with a brute fact right now that that's just how it is I have to go to work that's just how it is. I'm looking at things hanging off the walls. That's just the way it is. I'm wearing this shirt because I put it on. All of that is determined. So how much control do I have over that? Very little. It, it, it would, I would say it's all, it looks almost like nothing. <clears throat> but wait a minute. There's two, there's two elements to perception. There is that which is out there, and then there is that which perceives it. So maybe all the brute facts of determinism are determined, and things just are, but I seem to have some sort of input into it. Now, this goes back to the sort of attempts that I've made in the past to sort of pivot your view of time. I'll leave a link to a video below where I sort of describing... 
um, the conventional view of time, which I think, I think, in Mendham shares, where you're actually looking through the rear window of a forward-moving car driving up the street, and you're seeing the world go by like this. And what is behind you is dominant in everything. There are other views of time, um, and um, the one that fascinates me, the one that seems to be Nietzschean and Tantric, ironically, is to not look backwards, but to look forwards, to look over the driver's shoulder and through the windsc windscreen. Now, this will drive you kind of crazy, because what you're doing is you're sort of... All the past is used as an anchor to make sense of the present for most people. Um, it, it helps you make sense out of what is going on around you. I look over and I see a window. Well, I've been taught what a window is. I've been taught that a window makes sense and that it serves a function. And the past has always told me that when I open the window, something happens. Windows are there for a reason to let light in, to keep the elements out, that kind of thing. Windowness is something that I've learned. <coughs> what if I abolish all of that? What if I just sort of say, okay, never mind about you know, looking backwards to explain everything. How about we sort of strip ourselves of all preconceived notions? And you see, it's interesting, the word, eh? Preconceived. Um, I'm looking at the window and I'm deciding that it's a window, whereas all that it is is a configuration of molecules. Um, take that away. Take away the actual... Um, interpretation part of it. And that's looking through the windshield of the moving car. And that is going to have the same effect as, you know, my medieval French monk walking into the cave. The cave that's filled with satanic uh, whatever, art or whatever. Um, it's just completely different. It's the the modern metaphor, I would say, is let's say that you still perceive things, but you had absolutely no memory whatsoever of anything. You had no short-term or long-term memory, but you're still perceiving things. You're still looking at everything. I think that that's the way I, I, I suppose a newborn would see the world. Um, it's just utterly different. Alien. Now, <clears throat> I think in Mendham and I split on this. Now, again, I'm not denying that his view of... I'm not disputing his view of time or his view of the progression of events. What I'm saying is there is more than one way to look at that. And that's the interesting way that we seem to divide here. Um, I put the emphasis on the moment of perception and that which is perceived. Others, I assume, and Mendham being one of them, would say, no, what is more important are the implications of our perceptions, not just the perceptions themselves. Now, how you're going to reconcile those two is fascinating. It's It's a good illustration of the um, divide between, colloquially put, life-denying and life-affirming. And again, to be serious, there is no real distinction between the two. I think most people come down in the middle, myself included. I, I would say I err more on the side of the moment of becoming, but you know, I, I think about my future all the time. Um, <clears throat> So you, you sort of, when you do, when you think about the implications of existence, the abstractions involved, as opposed to the brute facts of existence, um, I think that you get something along the lines of quote unquote, sorry for the term, life denial, because it tends to sort of hit you the way that Zappi's caveman gets hit, the moment of realization that causes existential horror. He realizes the implications of existence. He's no longer just a hunter going out killing things to eat them. 
he, he stops and he abstracts. And he says, wait a minute, what does all this mean? What does this mean for them? What does this mean for me? What does this mean about the existence that we're living, that we have? Wow. Um, <clears throat> that is, I think, the, the way things divide. Um, and I don't really see how they can, one can sort of refute the other. It's just a question of emphasis. Um, as I say, I, I, I tend to be, a, <clears throat> I would say, a life affirmer, the tiger riding view of things. But I, I get on fine with what I would call life deniers, like Jains and you know, even antinatalists and stuff like that. There's, there's no, no issue there. But I don't really see how one can actually refute the other because they're based upon assumptions that are so utterly apart from each other. Uh, another thing is, say, and Menda mentioned agony and ecstasy, where nothing can equal a nail through the eye. Well, the tantric would say, no, there are things that can equal a nail through the eye and make getting a nail through the eye worth it. But they're about as likely to happen of their own volition as getting an actual nail through your eye. Um, the practices that I refer to that I engage in, yoga and certain types of meditation and everything are aimed at awakening that kind of ecstasy I suppose um, an ecstasy that goes beyond uh, eating a cupcake or goes beyond a mere you know an orgasm like the, the what the tantrics generally call the kundalini experience is a profoundly ecstatic experience that's supposed to change you forever once you've actually gone through it um, and that's life affirmation, if you ask me. How do you get the absolute most out of the brute fact of your own existence? Um, and it has the effect of, in a, in a sense, as Amanda aptly points out, blinding you yourself to some of the bad things that are happening, because you're concentrating on that which is I don't know ecstatic as opposed to that which is agonizing your your view your your view like you understand that agony is there as I say tantra is filled with horrifying images you know that it's there but you sort of you don't really cope with it the same way other people do by trying to prevent it you try to love it I suppose amor fati that you love necessity you love that which simply it is I look around and I know that say there's a civil war in Syria not nice, is it? But that's necessity, isn't it? Can I just snap my fingers and there's no more civil war? No. Okay, what do I do? I get depressed about it or do I love it? See what I mean by saying things like that and people shake their heads. This goes against the entirety of Western thinking. Um, <clears throat> you know, it's the old good men to do nothing, evil flourishes, that kind of thing. Um, and only a few people are able to actually engage in things like Tantra or whatever. Like it, it requires an awful, it requires a certain degree of wealth and freedom and things like that to do all of this. If you're working 16 hours a day in a rice field, you don't really have much time for um, long periods of meditation or you know things like this. You need a certain amount of leisure. You need a certain amount of luxury. A certain amount of protection from the elements. Um, you even need the ability, the mental ability, to rise or not, I shouldn't say rise above, but to set yourself apart from the rest of humanity, because the rest of humanity is going to think that you're insane when you do this. Um, that's that's not something that's open to everybody. Okay. You, are you going to tell me that the world is con is naturally fair? I don't think that it is. Um, you can say that it should be fair, but again, we're dealing with abstractions, not with the brute facts of existence. And if you are willing to sort of awaken your senses, awaken your perceptions, awaken your inner and your outer perceptions, awaken your emotions, awaken your feelings, awaken all of that, I would argue, and, and again, <laughs> I would argue is kind of a wrong way to put this, but it seems... From my perspective, 
apparent that there is more in terms of human experience than sense gratification or at least the sense gratification in the way that we see it where you just constantly delude yourself with things to gratify your senses you lay on the couch and you drink beer and eat potato chips and watch pornography or TV or something like this and spend the evening in the bars and the flesh pots um, that's not what I mean by awakening your senses if you ask me too much ridiculous over-the-top hedonism has the effect of dulling your senses so a certain degree of deliberate cultivation of restraint uh, is essential to this and you have to sort of play with your own perceptions to sort of see that you can actually manipulate the value that you get out of things um, but again this is based upon the moment this is based upon actual experience things that you can actually experience in the now where you're looking over the driver's shoulder into the face of becoming into the face of existence um, and I don't think most people actually think that way or see time that way we're sort of wedded to this 2016 is different from 2015 and the age of chivalry actually existed and we're looking forward into colonizing space and we're just a dot on this long continuum um, I won't say that I don't see time that way but I try to temper that with a view that um, there are other ways to perceive them and by the same token there are other ways to perceive pleasure there are other ways to perceive perception itself that's so far apart I think in the two ways of looking at things or, or your emphasis is so far apart that I'm not sure that they're one is capable of refuting the other I think that they can look, come to some sort of modus vivendi but that's about it um, and I think that it's almost you're almost set up to sort of be antagonistic because <coughs> the tantric writ large here the tantric stereotypical looks at nirvana and says who wants that who wants this crazy abstraction it doesn't mean anything it's, it has nothing to do with the moment of becoming which is all that there is you say well you'll get off the wheel of, of existence at, you know when you've done all of this well wait a minute that's nothing to do with right now that's nothing to do with the actual reality that I'm in that's an abstraction it's a projection how about learning to be now and not only just to learn to be now in, in the quote unquote eternal present but to be now in the best possible way from one's own perspective it's a profoundly individualistic um, philosophy uh, so individualistic that you know it takes on sometimes the elements of atomism and even being sort of deliberately heretical um, whereas a sort of linear type person perception of time would look at the sort of moment of becoming type view of things and say all that you're doing is your or what you could conceivably be doing would be making a mess for everything else that's on that continuum that's true I agree but that's an objection it's not a refutation um, and as I say I think most people sort of come down somewhere in between the two polarities I don't think you'll ever see a pure and utter renunciant and I don't think you'll ever see a pure and utter um, what would you call it Nietzschean or um, tantric or um, life affirmer that existence itself is enough and always will be and there's not even an always will be there is only the brute fact of existence um, it's an interesting debate and it's something that's fascinated me for as long as I can remember and it continues to and and it's interesting that the, the uh, one thing that I do like is the more that each side studies the other or debates the other the more it sharpens your own view of your own philosophy I guess um, 
and you know, again, when I get into these debates, I don't even expect a resolution or a victory or anything. And, and I don't, it might not even be a debate. Uh, in the Western view of things, you have for and against, and two people, one one group taking one point of view, the other group taking the other, or one person. You know, the medieval university thing where you see two guys at podiums at the office at the end of the room, dialectical discussion and everything like that. I don't think this is possible. That kind of thing is possible in this kind of a discussion. I think all you can really do is explain your point of view.